Uh, my name is Tim, in case you don't know, and I'm uh, the pastor of The Journey. And so grateful that uh, you're with us this morning from wherever you're worshiping. Uh, glad that you've joined us. And I just want to encourage you that uh, if you would just sign in, if you're watching on Facebook, sign in on Facebook Live so that we uh, know that you're with us. Offer your presence to the Lord and, and to our community of faith here. And uh, if you're interested in following along uh, in the message today, there are sermon notes that you can download off of our website, and there will be a, a link that will pop up in your Facebook live feed there uh, that will take you to that, and you can download and, and print those out on your, on your printers at home. Um, so far, if uh, you look at 2020, I, I kind of think that you could say, it would be accurate to say that, that 2020 has been knocking off pins like the PBA, All right? Just like hope has been dashed over and over and over again. Hope has been knocked off like pins on the PBA. That It, it began like in, in the, the spring with cancellation of, of proms and, and, and graduations and all those kind of end-of-the-year school things for kids, and, and now kids going back to school and, and not having their first day of kindergarten or their first day of first grade or their first, gray of first, grade, first day of high school and, and all of those things. And, and hopes about careers and jobs have, have been knocked off by unemployment or by cut, cuts that have maybe derailed um, promotions or, or raises and, and those kinds of things. Dream weddings have been knocked off and, and fabulous plans for great occasions have been reduced to just a few people. Um, just in all different kinds of ways, we find hopes being dashed. And um, I just want to wanna take a, do a brief survey here this morning, and this is for you personally. Um, but I wonder today, if you, if you think about what hope, what is it that you are hoping for today? What are you hoping for? If you're really brave, courageous, or um, just if you'd like to, go ahead and, and type that in the Facebook feed. What, what is it that you're hoping for today? I'd encourage you, identify something. It will help you as we go through this, right? What is it that you are hoping for today? How important is it to you? How bad do you want it? How confident are that you will someday at some point in time receive it, that what it is that you hope for will actually happen, that it will come to reality. And, and if you have this hope and, and you think it will become a reality, how long do you think you'll have to wait? Is it just around the corner? Is it, is it coming any day? Or does it look like it's going to be a year or five years or ten years? Or maybe you don't know if it will ever happen. I want to contend this morning that, that whatever that is, whatever it is that you're hoping for, and your confidence in its coming to reality, and the duration for which you will have to, to wait, if you answer those questions with authenticity, they will actually give you a window into your soul, to the well-being of your soul today. How well is your soul? Well, how well is your hope Things that you're hoping for, are, are they significant? Are they things that really matter? Does it look like it's going to happen, right? If you're like hoping today that, 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 you know, that maybe by the end of the day that you'll have a break to, to binge watch Tiger King, and that's what you're really hoping for, and you're, and you're pretty sure that that's going to happen, then, then that might be something that you want to look into, that maybe your soul is running a little shallow um, right now. If you're hoping... Um, you know, for some great desire, aspiration, but it looks like that may never happen, then your soul may be in despair. If you have great hopes and you see it on the horizon, you can see it coming up, then your soul may <clears throat> be full of, of joy. What is your hope? If you've um, ever been to uh, our, our sanctuary, if you've worshipped here in the journey, you may have seen a picture I, I want to show you this morning. Uh, it's in our, in our garden uh, on the north side of the sanctuary. Uh, it's an anchor. And it's been there, I think, probably since they built this, built this sanctuary. And um, it's actually a, a pretty significant symbol in, in the life of Christian. You know, I think we probably, many of us, have envisioned Jesus carrying the cross, 
right? That, that Jesus carried the cross to Calvary um, to sacrifice his, his life for, for the forgiveness of our sins. And, and we've seen pictures of that and, and images of Jesus carrying that cross and can imagine that in their mind. But Hebrews describes Jesus, the book of Hebrews describes Jesus carrying a, another piece of hardware. It says it this way. This is in, from Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. It says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus had entered on our behalf. The, the, images, the imagery that Hebrews is using here is this, the inner sanctuary of um, is a reference to the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a portable church that God gave to um, the Israelites when they came out of bondage in Egypt and they began their, their trek through the wilderness on the way to the promised land. God gave them the tabernacle to be this portable worship center that they would use on their journey. And this tabernacle was a tent that was surrounded by a courtyard. And in the courtyard um, is where the, the priest would bring, um, would offer the sacrifices that the, the people would bring to, to atone for, to cover their sins in this pre-Christ um, sacrificial system that was all foreshadowing what Jesus was going to do. And then with, around this courtyard, in the middle, there's this, this tent. And in the tent, there's two rooms. The first room is the holy place, and there were certain um, symbols or uh, relics in the holy place that, that reminded the, the priests of the works that God had, had done and, and was doing on behalf of his people. And then beyond the holy place was called the, the most holy place or the holy of holies. And the holy of holies was the place that was the seat of God for Israel, the, the sign of his presence. Now, God didn't actually live there. God dwells in heaven, right? And God is in him. We live and move in our, and have our being. God is all around us. God is everywhere. But for the Israelites, it was the sign of God's presence with them on this journey through life that they were on. The tabernacle, was, um, the, the, the tabernacle was the pattern then for what would be the temple, which when Israel was settled in the promised land and, and had the nation that God had promised us, they built the temple, and the temple had the same kind of format. You had the courtyard and then the holy place and the most holy place. And in the temple, there was a curtain in, from the holy place to the most holy place from top to bottom. And Scripture tells us that, that when Jesus died, died on the cross, that the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. And, and revealing to us and making way, opening the path for not just the priests, but for all people through Christ to come into, to enter into the dwelling place of God. And so this imagery that, that Hebrews uses of, of this, this anchor in the inner sanctuary, in the inner sanctuary is, a, is an image of Jesus actually taking an anchor and chaining it to our soul and then walking into the harbor of God's dwelling, sticking with the, this um, imagery of an anchor, walking into the, to the center of God's dwelling with our soul chained to the anchor and laying it, anchoring it, setting it at his feet. That, that this, Jesus is saying, this anchor is connecting us to the very presence of God. What is this anchor that we have? What is it that Jesus is anchoring in the presence of God on our behalf? Hebrews says the anchor is hope. Hope is the anchor for our soul. Now, last week, we talked about the, the now and the not yet of the, of the Christian faith, that because Jesus has, um, was crucified, died, um, atoned for our sins, was raised to new life in Christ, ascended to the Father, sent his Holy Spirit, that the new kingdom that he's inaugurated, that he's announced, um, we have the first fruits of that kingdom that's ministered to us by his Spirit. 
But that there's this part of it that we're still waiting for the fulfillment of, the consummation of that kingdom. So we have the first fruits, but not the fullness of the kingdom. That there's a now and a not yet to our faith. And in the not yet part of our faith, that, that there is hardship, that there's suffering. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have trouble. Take heart. I've overcome the world. I've won the battle for you. But right now, it's going to be tough. And Paul, referring to in Romans chapter 8, the now and the not yet, he says that it's true there isn't a now. There is a now, and our now is filled with hardship and suffering. But he says of it that, that what we suffer now, the, the things that we're going through, are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed when all things that Jesus promised are fulfilled. He says it's in this hope that we were saved. That in this thing we want, but that we don't yet have, that's what we were saved in. Which is to say this, and this is really important for us to know. Right? If you choose to follow Jesus, if you purpose to center your life around the creator of the universe and the redeemer of your life, if you choose to walk with God, if you choose to follow Jesus, ready? Are you hear me on this? You are going to have to wait. You're going to have to wait. That, in fact, you're going to be in the long line of people who have and continue to wait. In Hebrews chapter 11, the author of Hebrews lays out a a large portion of that line. He says that, that people since Abel and Enoch and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and the prophets and all the saints that come after them, all of them have been waiting for the same thing that we're waiting for now. And when you wait, anybody who's ever waited, you know that waiting is hard sometimes. It's hard to wait. And when I'm thinking about that, apply the, the, soul, the survey that I did at the beginning uh, to apply that s- survey to this waiting that we're doing now. What is the hope that we're waiting for? How much do we want it? How much are we longing for it? How much do we aspire to it? How confident are we that that hope will be fulfilled, this thing that that we're waiting for? How confident are we? That's the faith question. Hebrews says faith is being sure, very confident, absolutely positive about what it is that we hope for. How sure are we of our hope? And how long are we going to have to wait? And I think it's safe to say longer than most of us want to. Longer than many of us thought that we would have to. What is this soul? What is this hope that's weighty enough to anchor our soul while we wait for its fulfillment? I think... A lot of times what, what comes to mind for, for many of us is it's eternal life, right? That's, we're, we're waiting for eternal life. Well, what is eternal life? Well, we don't know a whole lot about it, but, but, but we know that it's, that it's heaven, not hell. And that's enough, right? I mean, I don't want to go to hell, so heaven sounds like a much better, even if I don't know for sure what it is. Jesus says it actually goes, it goes much farther than just eternal life. In fact, it's not just about heaven. Beginning with Hebrews chapter 12, and because we're in the book of Hebrews, what does Hebrews say that hope, hope is? In 12 verse 28, it says that the hope that we're waiting for is we live right now in a world that's, that can be shaken, that has been shaken, that is being shaken. We know, right? We know that we live in a world that can be shaken. That this hope that we're waiting for, Hebrews chapter 12, 28, 28 is a kingdom that cannot be shaken. A kingdom that cannot be shaken. When Jesus talked about this kingdom, 
He said that, that the Son of Man himself, that he was going to take this glorious throne. And when he takes his, this throne in this kingdom that he has come to establish and is fulfilled, he calls it, he says that we will experience the renewal of all things. The, everything in all of creation will be renewed. We have this vision given to John in Revelation chapter 21. It says, then I saw, this is the renewal of all things, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had passed away, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout, from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. I am making everything new. It's, it's the transformation of the pride lands. When Simba takes his place as the king again after going Hakuna Matata, and, and all things around, all of a sudden what's that's dark and dead comes to life and radiates beauty and glory. It's the Titanic lying at the bottom of, sea, of the sea rusting away and the light piercing through the windows and moving through the ship and bringing about complete transformation back into the ballroom where the beauty meets her beloved again. It's the ballroom being transformed when alas the beast has won the heart of Bell. And everything is made new. It is a restored creation. We saw this last week in Romans chapter, in Romans chapter 18. The creation itself is being held back, is in bondage, but creation will be liberated. That all of creation will be made new. Most of you um, know that I love um, to backpack. And, and I don't love to backpack because I love carrying 50-pound packs up mountains. I don't love it because I like sleeping on the ground. In fact, I really don't like sleeping on the ground very much. I love backpacking because the farther away you get from where people live, the less spoiled you find creation to be. You find beauty that hasn't been tainted so much by the sin and the brokenness of our world. And... The creation being liberated. Even those places, right, are still stained. And all of this, the places that you love the most, that you love to do, if you've been to, to Maui or, or Kauai or, or you love sitting in your backyard, all the things that, that even spoil those beautiful places, the places that are gone, all things made new. Restored creation. A restored connection with God. That God now dwells among his people. That all the, the looking and all the longing we say that the God is not that hard to find, and yet somehow he seems so elusive to us sometimes. And, and he will be like visibly in our presence. None of the things, God is here, none of the things that keep us seeing him from where he is, all those things are removed. A completely restored connection with God being restored to your true self. Who would you be today if you had never experienced heartache? If you had never been rejected, made fun of, picked last, failed? Who would you be today if you hadn't endured all of the pain and the suffering and the difficulties and the challenges that life throws at you? Who would you be if you never put on a mask again 
to hide from others what you feel shame about, but you don't want them to see, that you could allow people to see you in all of your beauty and glory, a restoration of your true self, all of our relationships made new, right? All the people that we have misunderstandings, that they're them, their true selves, we're our true selves, all things are made known. We understand the things that we didn't understand before. We see the things that we couldn't see at the time. Healed of all the things that created separation. Not just healing relationships person to person, a healing of the relationship between the nations. Think about all the turmoil in our society right now. All of that being restored, being made new, being re reconciled to God. A restored role, you being restored to that for which you were created, right? You, heaven and a new earth, a new heaven, a new earth, a new kingdom is actually not going to be like an endless vacation. Jesus told a parable of the kingdom. It says the kingdom of heaven is like a person who takes the talents that they've been given and, and uses them for good and brings a return on their investment. And at the end of that parable, Jesus says, you've been faithful with a few things with, that you've been given on earth. Now it will put you, put you in charge of. Now you have responsibility for. Now you're going to be the ruler of many things. Roles that bring fulfillment, not frustration and disappointment. All good things, we say this all the time, all good things must come to an end. But it won't. What, if you wrote the perfect ending of your story, right? if you sit down and say, what, how do I want this, my life to end? What do I want the last chapter to be? If you wrote the perfect ending of your story, whatever the ending is, it will be better than what you today define as the best possible. Paul says, no, I has seen no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. You can't even imagine how good it is, but go ahead and try. Because we need hope to anchor our soul, this hope that Jesus carried the anchor into the, the harbor of God's dwelling, chained our soul to it so that we would not be shaken. Horatio Stafford was a prominent lawyer in the 1800s, heavily invested in real estate. He lost a ton of his properties in the fire of Chicago in 1871. He lost a, a, a lot of, uh, more of his wealth in an economic downturn in 1873. He had um, planned a trip to Europe with his wife and his four daughters. But at the last minute, he had business that he had to tend to, so he sent them on their way. As they made the trek across the Atlantic, there was an accident, a collision with another boat, and the, wife, and the boat that his wife and four daughters were on sank into the sea. He would find out about this tragic accident when he got a telegram from his wife that said, Saved Alone that his four daughters had all died in this accident. God, spare us that kind of experience of loss in our life. We don't hope for that. But we live in a world where it happens. As Horatio Spafford made the trek across the Atlantic to be reunited with his wife, near the spot where the accident happened, he penned one of the most um, famous hymns and one that has touched many people's hearts and lives. He penned the hymn, It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. And if you read the stanzas, the verses in that hymn, you will see that, that he had confidence and hope in the fact that he had been saved by Christ's love, forgiven for his sins. 
and that he had full confidence in the triumphant return of Christ and in the renewal of all things. I, I read his story, and, and right now I think about the kind of things that I hope for. You know, I hope that when I call Frontier Communications this week, that they will actually treat me like a human being, that they will repent of all their formal evil ways, right? And actually answer my questions and tell me the truth and deliver on the things that they tell me that they will deliver on. I, I hope that when I drive down the freeway that the person who's in front of me will actually drive like they've driven before and have some idea of what they're doing. And I think about how frustrated and how angry I get sometimes about even those ridiculous things, and I think about what are those things saying about my hope, and where is my hope, and how do I live? See, I want to be the kind of person with an anchored soul, because I'm looking forward to a future glory. I'm going to close with some counsel from from um, the book of Hebrews. This is from chapter 10. About being well in our soul while we're waiting. Because there's a lot. There's a lot going on. And there's a way to live in the midst of it. Well in our soul. Hebrews says this. Verse 10, 22. Draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. Run to God. And in Hebrew, he talks about we can. We can run to God with full assurance of faith because Jesus has gone before us. So do we have sin? Do we have shame? Do we have things that we're... He's, yes, you do. But Jesus has covered all that. Jesus has atoned for all that. So forget all of it. Don't worry about what you did yesterday or how bad you're feeling right now or about how ashamed you... Run to God. Run to Him. Draw near to Him. Lean into Him. You need Him more than you need. And He is ready and willing and available to welcome you into your presence. Right? That is what Jesus came to do to open the door, to tear down the curtain so that as we are today, not where we wish we would be, not where we think we should, where we are today, God welcomes us. Run to God. Hold on to hope, verse 23. Unswervingly, hold unswervingly to the hope we profess because he who promised is faithful. Hold on to your hope. What is it? I, I forgot to bring out my, I have a little box that I've made. I don't have a bucket list. I have a, um, it's kind of a, a, a spiritual version of a dowry. And I put things in that box that I look forward to in my future. Maybe in this life, but if not in this life, in the life to come. And I have a race car in there because I would love to someday drive a, a race car like really, really fast, and I think that'd be really cool. I have some places that I want to visit in there. I have some people that I want to have conversations in, in, in that box because I want to, to be stirring up the images of the renewal of all things and what that looks like because I need that Hope as an anchor for my soul. All the renewal of all things. Hold on to your hope. Both hands, hang on. See, your soul's anchored. It's not at stake. But in our minds, we forget. Remember, hold on to it unswervingly. And then in verse 24, and spur one another on to love toward love and good deeds. Do not give up the habit of meeting together, which we are being challenged on. I'm glad that you're using the resources you have today. And we are going to be doing some things this fall to, um, to strengthen our connections again, launching um, small groups and communities to help us in holding on to our hope, to spurring one another on to love and good deeds, to meeting together and to encouraging one another all the more as we see the day approaching. He says, run to God, hold on to hope, and stay connected to the, your spiritual family. 
Stay, whatever, by whatever means, any means necessary, stay connected to your family. That hope is ours through Christ. Run to your heavenly Father. Hold on to the hope that Jesus gives us and do it together with the family because we need each other on the journey. Next week, we're going to take all the things that we've been talking about, this, this journey of creation and fall and redemption and restoration from the macro level, and we're going to come right down into the very part of our own stories and, and what this means, not just in, on the macro level, but on the micro level, for your life, for your story. So grateful that you're with us and encourage you to continue with us on this um, journey of answering the question, what's your story? Lord, I pray that as we continue to walk through this chapter of our lives, that we would be people who walk in hope. And that that hope would guard and protect us. Encourage and strengthen us. Inspire and motivate us. Pray that you would help us with our imaginations to think beyond the little things that we get wrapped up in, to look beyond the frustrations and the disappointments of a given day, to see a future that is so glorious that it's not worth comparing, that our, that our current suffering, our current challenges aren't even worth noting anymore. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.